Okay, it's 5.35, so we're gonna get started now. Um, before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today. I would also like to pay my respects to elders past and present. So just a little bit about Datasoc to begin with. Datasoc was founded in 2017, and with over 3,200 followers, we are the largest constituent data science society in Australia. We, in, we are an open community platform with the aim to connect, educate and empower all students and help them discover how data shapes our world. Our events range from um, career development and education workshops to social um, events to connect our students. So here are your hosts for today. We have Noah, who is a third year data science student, Julian, who is also a third year data science student, myself, and I'm a first year data science student, Julian, who's a second year maths and stats student, and Sophia, who is a third year computer science and stats student, and Shub, who's a third year data science student. Um, so today, firstly, we'll be giving you an introduction to PySpark. Then we'll be going through the basics of changing data types and renaming columns. Um, after that, we'll show you some more features such as filtering data, group buys, joins, We'll move on to some more advanced features, then we might have a bit of time for questions at the end. So what is PySpark? Spark is a data processing engine which processes and stores large sets of data in real time. It is very powerful and used for rapid analysis for extremely large data sets. It was initially developed by the University of California Berkeley's Algorithms, Machines and People's Lab as a project. After success and popularity, it became open sourced and was then further developed by Apache as a top project. Spark is supported by many languages, but PySpark is, which we'll be focusing on today, is the Python API for Spark. So why should we be using PySpark? PySpark is widely popular because it enables extremely fast processing and contains resilient distributed data sets, or RDDs, which save time and re when reading and writing operations. Because these RDDs have no data initially, they are distributed across multiple nodes, which increase PySpark's fault tolerance. As if one node will fails, the other RDDs are not affected. Additionally, PySpark offers many SQL queries and machine learning algorithms for complex analytics and has an easy to use interface. Now I'm going to pass over to Julian, who's, begin, who's going to begin taking you through the basics um, in our workshop. Hi, um, I'm Julian, a uh, second year math stats student. Okay, so let's get started with using the Spark. Um, once you get the link, um, click, uh, go on to file tab and um, yeah, click. There is gonna be a playground mode and click the playground mode and then go good to go, it should be. I'm sorry, there's a... <laughs> okay, so from here, um, you can install Spark with pip by like typing this code. And after that, it will, it should be, it's already running. That's so cute. I'm sorry, it's like. Should I go on to take it off? Fine. And uh, Julian, mine seems to be working, so you can just go off. Yeah. You can just go off mine if you want. <laughs> Thank you very much. No. Oh, okay. Um, so, and once you, uh, you have got your PySpark ready, uh, installed, now it's time for you to use it. Uh, first you have to import P PySpark package and then you have to import Spark session 
from PySpark SQL, SQL to use Spark session build a get or create function. Uh, this function is normally used to create a connection and it will return exist, uh, the, the existing session if there is one already or creating a new one. And at the end, we will import PD as the alias of pandas. Uh, the code over here, uh, we can start a name for the application will be shown. Uh, and if, if we type Spark, it will show the version of Spark you're running and then the name of the application that you have already set. <laughs> Next. Okay. Now, if you want to read a file, say it's a comma separated value file, um, simply you can use pd, pd.readcsv, and then the location. Then, you need to convert the data frame into the form that PySpark can read, which is uh, Spark create data, create data frame method. And let's check the data frame with dot show method. So you will see the data frame over here. And then it, it is showing 10 rows because we put 10, the number 10 in the parenthesis of show. Um, and then we can use print schema method to check data type of each column. Yeah. And nullable is true, an option that the object can be null. It, it is true by default. So PySpark does not solely process in memory, process in multiple nodes. Spark is a platform for cluster computing. computing. Spark lets you spread data and do computations over clusters with multiple nodes and say, uh, uh, think of it, uh, think node as a separate computer. For PySpark, unlike Python, uh, if, you want to, uh, if you want the machine to show data, you have to put does show method since, yeah, since Spark will only compute what you have asked at the very last moment. Okay. And, Similar, similar to data, a pandas data frame. If you want to see the column names, uh, you can easily put dot columns at the end of the data frame. Now you can see the column names. Yeah, you can, yeah, you can, now you can see the column names from there. Uh, if you are going to choose specific columns, then you need to let PySpark to select the columns. For, for this, you need to use dot select method and if you want to see the data you have selected, dot show method. And dot show, met, uh, show method uh, has a parameter n, which you can set the number of rows, like you have seen 10 before. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, uh, there is a, a select expression method, but this method takes SQL-like function, uh, SQL-like expressions to execute. Uh, this gives you more abilities to use SQL-like expressions. For example, if you want your has credit card a column to shown to be shown differently, you can type. Uh, you can use as like like the codes like shown here. Uh, and then the last function I am going to show you, yeah, yeah is the describe function that it gives you an, a statistical summary. From the result, you can see STDDEV, which, is, which stands for standard deviation. And standard deviation of age is around 10.5. Okay, so there is like, so quick quiz. So what's the max, what's the max of the number of pro products in this data frame? Any, any idea? Anyone like max of number of number of products? So yeah, it is the max. Yeah, the count. If it is like the number of products, then it's gonna be five thousand. But like since it is like the max the maximum number of, of products, so it's gonna be four because if you follow like 
the, the column is number of well, products and then the row is going to be max, so it's going to be four. Thank you, Josh. All right. So I'm going to pass it over to no. Thanks, Julian. Um, very insightful. I think that was some really good content. And um, so for the next little while, we're going to go through. So you've seen now how we can like view our data, how we can select columns. What happens if we actually want to change the underlying content of our data? And what we're going to be going through here is one, changing data types, two, doing things like renaming columns, and then eventually down the line, we'll do things like filtering particular rows that we're interested in. Um, but without further ado, let's actually go into how we can change data types within like our PySpark session. Now, the reason why changing data types is important just in general with data analysis is because if we have numbers, for example, that are being stored as strings and not actual numbers, then we can't really do any sort of arithmetic operations. And that's where things like machine learning then become futile. So the idea is we want to make sure all of our data is of the right type before we do any sort of modeling or further pre-processing. And that's what this next section is for. So let's say we had age being stored as strings instead of actual numbers. Um, if we were to actually try convert this into a numeric form, we would do the following things. So these following imports will take care of that. What we see here is from the PySpark.SQL.Types module, we can import a few classes, most notably the double type, integer type, and date type. We're not gonna be using date type, but anytime you wanna convert to a date, let's say you have dates that are being stored as strings and we wanna convert them to actual dates, we can use date type. Um, from the PySpark.SQL.Functions module, we're gonna import two functions, one being call and another one being user defined function. Um, and you'll see where that's being used soon. Now, Let's say we wanted to convert our age column, which was storing strings into actual integers. So the way in which we do that is we essentially say um, with our data, um, with the column, which is called age in our data frame, we wanna create a new column age, which is casted to an integer data type. So we're essentially overriding, we're overriding the existing age column with the integer converted age column. So what we're doing is we're grabbing the column called age and we're casting it to an integer data type. And this integer type was imported just earlier over here. Um, we can also method chain this with another with column. And this time we're saying with the estimated salary column, um, we want to change this to a data double type D type. So essentially if it was storing strings, what we could do is create a new column estimated salary that takes the old one and casts it to a double data type. And that's being imported earlier as well. We'll store this in a new variable data by overriding our existing data frame and show the first 10 rows just to make sure that everything was done correctly. Um, we can double check that everything was done correctly using data.printSchema because what you're gonna see now is that with our age column, it's now an integer and with our estimated salary column, we now have double, in other words, floating point or like decimal numbers. Now, Instead of overriding existing columns, we can actually create new columns as well. So let's say I wanted to grab this estimated salary column right over here that we had in our data frame originally and create a new column, which simply just bumps 10% on it. And so what we can say is just like last time, we can use with column, but this time we're gonna say, we're gonna create a new column that has a name estimated salary next year and the way in which we plan on creating that column is by simply taking our old estimated salary column and timesing it by 1.1, i.e. increasing it by 10%. Again, using data.show, we can see the first 20 rows and double check that the arithmetic is correct. You could do one or two examples on your calculator and you'll see that the arithmetic is done correctly. Okay. Now we've seen how we can do sort of basic transformations to our data as in, you know, creating a new column by multiplying an existing one. But what happens if we wanna introduce some more intricate functionality that takes care of some more like sophisticated operations? And the way in which that happens is actually quite simple. So we're gonna use something called UDF, which was imported in earlier lines of code. And we'll see exactly how we can create our own functions 
and apply it to a particular column or multiple columns in our Spark data frame. So if we just scroll down here, let's say I wanted to create a new column based off this age column. So we have a whole lot of customers in our data set and based off the age of the individual, we wanna give them a certain discount. So maybe we wanna give 40 year olds one discount and 27 year olds another discount. And so just with some simple um, conditional here, just some if else logic really, um, depending on how old someone is, we're gonna give them a different discount. So if they're less than 35, give them a 10% discount. If they're between 35 and 50, non-inclusive, give them a 5% discount. And once we hit the else block, if any rows land up in the else block, give them a 1% discount. And so what we can do is use this age conversion function that I've created here. And what we essentially wanna do is with the column, we're gonna create a new column called age discounts. Now, the way in which we're gonna create that column is by running a user defined function where essentially for each value of age, we wanna run this age conversion function on that value, storing the results as a string, because this is a string. And that string type was something imported in earlier lines alongside double type and integer type. And so essentially what we're doing is, if you look here, um, we have a 42 year old, it lands in this part of the code. And so what happens is they get the 5% discount. And you know, for somebody of this age, 27 year old for example they fall in the else they fall in this if block and so what happens is um we get this function and it gives us the correct output over here and so that's how we do it um this udf being user defined functions allows us to essentially create our own functions we can make them as complicated as we want really and what happens there is that we can use that on a particular column to create new columns if we want to Alongside changing an existing column or creating a new one, we can actually rename columns quite simply. So instead of with column, um, we can do with column renamed. So with column, it was used previously, with column renamed is the only thing that's really changed here. And I guess you just read this like you would plain English. Um, the existing column is has credit card. So that was the old column and the one that we the name that we want to give it now is has credit card. So what you're going to see here, what was has CR card now is has underscore credit underscore card. And we'll store the result in the data variable, essentially overriding the previous data frame. Again, we can use dot show. I've just passed in two rows here. And what this will do is just double check that we've done it correctly, which we have. If we were to, if we were to temporarily create a column, what we could essentially do is use the select function or the select method really that Julian was using earlier. And what we essentially want to do here is using this call function that I actually imported earlier with the column called gender, we're going to alias it or nickname it sex and we're going to dot show. Now this is just like a temporary view. I haven't actually made this permanent at all. Um, so this is just, if you wanted to like, have a look at what like a renamed column would look like. And here it is. So essentially we're taking the column called gender and we're nicknaming it or aliasing it as sex. Okay, very nice. Another thing we can do is just like select, we can use select expression that you saw earlier. And instead of the column being called gender, we'll call it sex. Um, if we wanted to take a look at it, it's just being stored like this. But if we actually wanted to take a look at it, we could just pop a dot show at the end and it would show quite literally exactly what this is showing. So these two are functionally equivalent. Um, it's just different ways of doing the same thing. And I guess what select expression allows you to do is use um, SQL keywords like as. Because the libraries are so, um, because the programming languages are so um, similar in nature and PySpark kind of brings it all together. Uh, so that concludes my section for now. Um, I'm going to pass on to Sophia who's going to go into filtering and sorting data and um, yeah, enjoy. Uh, all right, oh, yeah. thank you, Noah, for a detailed explanation. 
and I will take over from here and introduce you guys to filtering. So in this section, we'll go through some most common ways to filter both. Um, for example, if we want to do gender-based statistical analysis, we can simply choose the column gender and its value equal to female using this filter function. And then as you can see from the table, um, all the selected rows now have gender as female. There are also, um, filter also have an bias, which is called weird. They can be used interchangeably and they're exactly the same. You can pass in the same kinds of parameters. So for inequality and integer values, we could use um, Boolean, the general operators that we use in programming languages. So, and since PySpark is so integrated with SQL, as just Noah mentioned previously, um, we can also use SQL expression as the parameters. So by passing the estimate salary column, which is less than or equal to 500, both tables will show the same results where the estimate salary column has value less, less than or equal to 500. And finally, a way is to filter columns the same way as pandas will do by using bitwise operators. Uh, we can group them inside the parentheses. So in this condition, we have an or where the first condition is when data, uh, when age is equal to 40 and gender is the male parentheses or when geography is for Spain. So as we can see, um, the first 19 rows here all have geography as Spain. So the last one satisfies the first Compose, um, composition of conditions, which is age equals 40 and gender equals to male. And next is we also have NAN in our data because of some mis um, interpretations of data or incorrect processing methods. So NAN stands for a not a number. It is different from NO. We use a different method to filter NO. But um, in this data set, if you want to filter out the NAN in the estimate salary column, use this functions is NAN. And luckily we don't have any NANs in our data set. So as you can see, um, we have no rows being filtered out. And it will be messy, just like previous on um, previous example, if you just want to stack all the conditions in the same prep, in a single line. So one way is just to assign the Boolean function, the Boolean statement as a variable and pass in the variable as parameters. So um, condition one is active member equals to one and C2 and C3. So when we filter things out, we'll have the results that satisfies all of the three conditions here. And lastly, we often need to sort our data. So the one way we use sort is just, is to use data.sort and passing the first argument is the we'll sort this by credit score first and then by the balance. So uh, yes, as you can see, um, this is default is to descending order. So score by 350, 350 and the top three are credit score 350, but the balance are also in ascending order. So it increases. And we can also sort them separately. The first column as descending order and the second column as descending or, or ascending order as well. So as you can see in the following two tables. Um, and okay, so in this example, we'll just finally combine all the techniques we have mentioned before. We'll be filtering the columns um, rows based on the three conditions, C1, C2, and C3. And then we sort them by their product score in descending order first, and we sort them by their balance in ascending order. And then to show, sorry, um, it is the same procedure as we have done. And that's everything interesting about but most common ways of the filtering rows, and we'll pass it to show for group bias and functions. 
Thanks, Sophia. Um, I'll just share screen. Yep. Um, that should be working now, hopefully. Hey, everyone, I'm Shub, um, and I'm going to be going through the very, oops, let me go down a bit, group by functions, basically. Um, it's a very small section uh, in PySpark, but it's quite important because um, what group by does essentially is that it collects identical data into groups on a data frame, and it performs aggregate functions on that group data. Now, what do I mean by aggregate functions? So aggregate functions can be things such as count, which returns the count um, of each rows for each group, sorry. Uh, you have the mean, which returns the mean of the values for each group. You got the maximum minimum values, you got the average, you got the sum. Um, and why we use this is because, for example, um, as you can see, I printed out a version of the data just so you guys have reference. But um, let's say if I wanted to get the average salary uh, for per uh, gender. So at Datasoc, we are proud uh, supporters of our girl bosses and we love women empowerment. So as you can see, the average female salary um, estimated for next year was actually higher than the males. And we can use group by functions to actually find this information. And it can give us insights into what the data can look like in terms of averages. Um, another example I have below is looking at the amount of products um, for each country. So you can see on the left-hand side, we've got countries, Germany, France, and Spain. And we've got the sum of total products that we can find in each of these countries. Um, moving forward, so what if I wanted to run multiple group by functions in one go? Um, how can I do that? And what do I need to implement? So as you can see the code um, here, what this does is what we have to do is add a dot aggregate. Um, I guess it's a function at the start. And what this does is that it actually, you can now include multiple different um, group by functions into sort of one big uh, data frame, essentially. So as you can see, this code sort of created a data frame, which has ge geography, and then it has some, some of total products, um, average number of total products, and then the average estimated salary for males in uh, total population as well. And what this can do is that it can sort of give you a whole general picture in one sort of code. And I think something that I forgot to mention was alias. So what does alias mean? It essentially um, names the column in a sense. And yeah, that's, I guess, a quick review of group by functions. Pass it on to Joins, uh, not Joins, Julian. Hey, Shub. Yeah, just let me share my screen. Okay, we'll get started. Okay, thanks everyone. I hope you've been enjoying the workshop so far. I'll be going through Joins. So the first thing we'll do is kind of a brief overview of what is joins if you've forgotten. So there's this pretty helpful Venn diagram here. So for this sort of section, we'll be looking at these, these two data sets. So before what you've seen is this sort of Chan data set or this financial style type of data set here. But now we're moving on to movies and their ratings. So we'll have one data set that just has information about the movies and then another data set that will look at the ratings for each movie. So we can imagine those data sets as two sets. So imagine the set on the left here, this left circle is the movies data set and this circle on the right is the ratings data set. And what we do when we join is we find a column in common. So we call that the key, the join key. And uh, then we're going to be effectively using that to join the two tables together. And then what, what that means is for whatever type of join you're doing. So for example, left joins, we take everything in the left table. So we're going to take all the rows from the movies data set. And then we're just going to take those ratings where there are movies. So effectively, is that's just that center part of the, the Venn diagram here. So we're just getting movies with ratings. Everything else, if a movie doesn't have a rating, it'll be null. And that's uh, what happens when we do this set operation. And again, there are multiple other types of joins here, but in this photo, there's just four. So to begin, we're just gonna load the data. So as you might've seen in the chat, I was talking about how in practice we probably not gonna be reading in our data from CSV. In actuality, we're gonna be dealing with data that has probably millions of rows, hundreds of millions of rows. Uh, and that is something like teradata's, uh, that has terabytes uh, of data. 
So that's not actually going to be stored locally. It's going to be stored on some type of computer cluster with uh, thousands of cores of compute power. But since we're just running it locally, what we can do is we can just use pandas to quickly read in a data frame and we're going to convert that to a Spark data frame. So what that effectively means is that we can run parallel operations now on our pandas data frame. And like you've seen before, I can do dot show here to actually show the movies data set. And you can see here that we've got our key here, our primary key, movie ID. We've got the title for each movie. And then we've got a bunch of genres here. What you might notice is that it's not exactly clean, this data set, which is why I guess Noah went through a lot of methods to actually go through changing data types and uh, making new columns to actually clean your columns. And moving on to the next data set, we can see here, we're looking at ratings. And again, we come up with this common primary key, this movie ID column. And you can already guess that we're gonna be using the movie ID column here to join. So given each, uh, ignore that for a moment, uh, given each movie ID, we have a rating and a timestamp. So this timestamp doesn't mean anything which again goes into the uh, argument of, you know, cleaning your data. And then as you guessed, we're gonna be joining those two columns and it's pretty simple to do in PySpark and it kind of uh, adapts the same sort of language or syntax that you might expect from SQL. So we're gonna specify our first table. So the movies, data frame, and then our second table here, our ratings data frame and Spark is going to ask us, how do we want to join it? What do we want to join it on? So we're going to specify that we want to join, we want to use the join key movie ID. So that's common to both, both uh, tables. And then how we're going to do it, we're going to do our left join. So from flashback to that Venn diagram before uh, this one here, we're just going to take this blue area. So all the movies that have ratings, and yeah, once we do that, we can do dot show and we see our final table. And you can see that Othello has a bunch of ratings. Arguably, uh, you can argue whether that's a good rating or not. But uh, moving down a bit, we can see if you do dot count, there's actually a bunch of more ratings and rows to look at. There's about 105,000. So although this might not be massive for some people, this is actually quite a good uh, amount of data to play around with. So after this, you can definitely go into this data set more and explore, uh, do some more, I guess, data analytics on this. And just for fun, we're gonna take a look at how many movies had missing ratings. So since we did that left join, we might end up with some missing values, but uh, I guess spoiler alert, there are no missing values. We did a perfect join and we can do that by again, as Sophia was talking about, we can use filter and we can filter for columns that are an A. So we use the, uh, the functions module. So we've done an with alias that is F uh, and then the dot is an NAN function on our column ratings. And yeah, we can see that there are no missing columns. So that's good. So that's it for joins. If any questions, feel free to put it all in the chat and I'll be happy to answer. So your questions. I'll hand it back to Julian again. It's always, uh, yeah, we'll pass it over to Julian. From Julian to Julian. So thank you. Thank you, Julian. So here's Julian again. And um, there's one more interesting method that I want to share. Um, as I mentioned, the select expression method uh, like expression function takes SQL like expressions. Um, there is one more way uh, create or replace temp view function that it takes um, the table and then it allow it to uh, take SQL like expressions. So from here, uh, it is like, uh, let's see from here. So from here, we, we can, um, create will replace temp view um, the name of the table that you want to you can use it to reference the table that uh, you want to reference and then temp view is used um, when you want to store the uh, table for your spark session and if you type 
Spark catalog list table. Uh, you will see the name of the table that you have referenced before, and then the type of the table, which is temporary. And yeah, it's temporary. And since um, the create or replace temp view takes SQL like expressions, so from here you can use parent, um, parenthes parentheses and then like select star, star is like all the tables. And from my table and the show method and number of uh, 10, 10 rows, then you will get the data over here. And then for the next one, if you want to select only geography, gender, age from my table, then you can, the result is going to be like this. So I will pass the next topic back to Julian. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Uh, let me share my screen quickly. Sorry, I was writing something in the chat. Okay. So as if things weren't complex enough, we're going to be doing some advanced PySpark concepts. So I'll quickly go through two concepts. So the first one being caching and persistence. So you might be wondering if you're going to be running queries a lot, it's going to be pretty inefficient to just keep on using that compute power for something that, you know, you could probably save it somewhere and then load it up again and reuse that query over and over again. So as I said here, like uh, any other concept for like a uh, similar concept from computer science, sorry, caching is a technique that we're going to use to optimize our queries. So Again, it's super helpful when you're using your query over and over again. And basically what it's doing is it's gonna store it on, in, in memory. So as we mentioned before, Spark actually doesn't work in memory. It's running all of this, uh, this computation on multiple computers, if you have multiple computers set up, of course. Uh, and that's usually gonna be the case if you're working in some company. So what we can do is, for example, if we run a dot count, so we're gonna count our data frame, the one we were using before initially, we can see that without any sort of caching optimization, it's gonna take around 213 milliseconds. But if I cache this uh, data frame, so what I'm doing is I'm basically saving it to memory. It's gonna take a little bit of extra time because it's actually saving it. But the next time we run it, we can see that we're actually getting a little bit of a uh, a time boost here. So saying uh, not exactly half the amount of time, but uh, it's still a pretty good amount of time that we're saving. So a sort of sub concept off of this is persistence. So persistence is pretty much exactly like caching, except that with caching, we're just saving to memory and disk, but persistence lets us be super uh, super careful where we want to save things. We can maybe just save it to disk or just save it to memory. There's also a bunch of other places we can save it, but uh, you can check that out by going to the docs here. Uh, and yeah, as we was, was also mentioned in the chat before, good thing about PySpark is that it's super fault tolerant and the same thing works with, works with caching. So if we've saved something locally in memory and that gets lost somehow, we can actually automatically recompute it. So by we, I mean PySpark. So it'll automatically recompute all your work if you've cached something. So the next part, I'll gloss over a bit. It gets pretty in depth, but we can take a quick look about how PySpark works under the hood. So now that we've actually got some sort of familiarity about how PySpark works, just from a super high level point of view, uh, just by running our SQL queries and using the PySpark API, you might be wondering, I guess, what's happening under the hood when I actually run things. So I think this flowchart gives a pretty good high level understanding. So once we're actually giving S uh, PySpark a SQL query, what it does is it goes through and actually tries to create some sort of plan about how it's gonna run your query. It's gonna do some optimization, then it's gonna generate a physical plan. A physical plan basically is just what is gonna be run on the nodes. So 
this is it's basically uh, the exact, almost the exact code that it's going to run. So this sort of stuff is super helpful, I guess, if you're more interested in data engineering or interested in DevOps. Uh, so we can actually see the physical plan. So for all you data engineering people out there, we can actually take a look at, let's say the for the movies and ratings join we did before, we can take a look at what the actual physical plan is so to most people, this doesn't mean much. To me, it doesn't mean much, but you can get sort of glimpses about what PySpark is actually doing. So what might be useful to a data engineer is taking a look at what types of joins PySpark is doing. So in this case, it's a sort merge join. Uh, and I guess there are a variety of other joins that could be going on there. So there's another type of join called broadcast joins. Uh, maybe as a data engineer, that would mean something to you, you might want to prefer one over the other. So this is the type of information that you might want to look at to really get in and optimize your queries to like the, 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 the nth level. So that was uh, PySpark under the hood. I won't bore people too much with that for all the high level data scientists out there. So I'll hand it back to Lily, who is going to finish it up for us. Okay, thanks so much. Um, okay, so thank you so much everyone for attending today. Um, we really hope you enjoyed the workshop. Um, if you just take two seconds to fill out this feedback form so we can um, improve on it and make future workshops even better for you.